So uh, John came over and invited me to visit Wat Buddha Tamma. I'm on a a world tour which began about three months ago in Thailand and then right now I'm here and on the way back to Thailand. And I was here at this uh, Wat Buddha Dhamma many years ago when uh, Bhikkhu Kantipalo was, I think he was building this sala then. It was in the 1980s, I believe. <clears throat> and so there's so much interest now in uh, Buddhist meditation, in mindfulness, vipassana, or whatever the different terminologies people use. But this uh, mindfulness is is not a new discovery. It's uh, it's absolute necessity, actually, for survival. Uh, we would have died long ago if we were never mindful. But now, say, on a developing mindfulness is developing mindfulness with wisdom, or in Pali, the word panya, panya combined with mindfulness. <clears throat> where, say, mindfulness uh, out of survival, you know, just learning to survive, to be aware of, of when you're crossing the street, driving a car, <clears throat> playing ping pong or whatever, you have to develop awareness, mindfulness, uh, focused on objects and on particular situations. Uh, but the basic problem the cause of suffering is ignorance of Dhamma, not knowing ultimate reality, not being aware of it, always operating from the uh, limitations that we find our personality, identity with the physical form, with the bodies we have, cultural biases, cultural conditioning, social identities, gender identities, all these uh, our conditioned attitudes that distort ultimate reality when we're, when we're ignorant of Dhamma, if we don't know ultimate reality, we're not awake to Dhamma, then of course we're always operating from these distortions um, that are part of, we, we experience life through through distortion rather than through wisdom. So wisdom, in the Buddhist sense of the word, English word wisdom, the word panya or discernment. And uh, discernment is is uh, ability to to know ultimate reality what is real and what is merely delusion or illusion. <clears throat> and it's not, it's not a critical function. Panya is not saying one thing is better than another. It's, it's uh, just awakening to, to the experiences of our life and seeing it through uh, the eyes of, of wisdom, of, of Buddha, or knowing ultimate reality. So this word ultimate reality is a word for Dhamma. But Dhamma has no form. It doesn't have any structure to it. It's not that you can actually uh, manifest Dhamma in, through the senses, but you can know Dhamma through wisdom. And so that's in terms of this uh, Theravada Buddhist tradition, the the words they use are Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha. So in the Thai forest tradition that I trained in, uh, with Lung Po Cha, they use the 
the um, mantra Bhutto, which is uh, the, uh, the name of the Buddha. And this is, and even in ceremonial Buddhism, we take refuge in Buddha, we, we chant Bhutang Sarnangachami, Dhammang Sarnangachami, Sankang Sarnangachami. We, we chant uh, these refuges uh, as part of a ceremony. In the Thai Force tradition, we use the name of the Buddha as a, as a mantra. And when I first uh, went to stay with Lung Pacha in 1967, um, I, newly orda- I was a newly ordained bhikkhu. My first uh, pansa or wasa was was at Wat Pa Pong with Lung Pa Cha. And uh, he, he obviously observed that I am, uh, you know, because I was the first Western monk uh, in his monastery, and then uh, we had problems around uh, language, because he could not speak uh, English, and I couldn't speak Thai. So there, the first month was well, there were two uh, Thai monks who were capable of translating, who could speak English, <clears throat> but they both left, and then the onus was on me to learn the uh, Thai language. But Nung Pho, uh, the thing that Nung Pho Chai emphasized with me was that because I was from a uh, Western culture, from a society where everything is is about thinking, about uh, obsessed thinking. I was a, a, had a skeptical tendency to think and doubt, to worry, and he could uh, he 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 knew this without me really mentioning it, and so he encouraged me to use the the mantra puto, he said, if you're going to think, just think this one word, two-syllable word. And that made a lot of sense, actually, because I couldn't just willfully uh, control thinking and uh, for any length of time. And uh, But I could think, intentionally think one word, puto, and uh, and then to make it with mindfulness to to develop it as as a, a way to stop the wandering mind, the proliferating thinking habits, uh, you would observe. You know, you'd you'd mention you'd you'd think to yourself, puto puto, and then uh, it, then it becomes quite mechanical, perfunctory. So you have to keep it bright. You have to emphasize it and kind of uh, exaggerate the word puto in your consciousness till it, it uh, and eventually uh, the mind, the thinking mind slows down and and uh, you actually kind of flow with the words puto, with the, with the one word. We also combine that with anapana sati because uh, Lumpa Cha was teaching mindfulness of the breath, uh, inhalation, you'd think to yourself put, and an exhalation to. Uh, and at first, and this is one reason why I used the mantra form first, was because uh, my mind was very fast and, and I had to, you know, I couldn't really sustained concentration on the, on just the breathing, the inhalation, exhalation, the mind would just wander off immediately. So I had to tie it to to the to the two syllables put on the inhalation, to on the exhala- on the exhalation. Now these are just ways of experimenting uh, to find out uh, more to, to it's not about attaining or g- getting anywhere because so much of our intention for meditation is to get rid of bad thoughts, bad feelings, worry, doubt, anger, jealousy, and fear. Try to attain 
uh, blissful states, consciousness with with just uh, a kind of sense of purity and and bliss is the ideal, or the what we long for. So in the Vipassana practices of investigating the Four Noble Truths, uh, this is where wisdom uh, dominates, because to, you, to take something like uh, the First Noble Truth, the truth of Dukkha, is, uh, or suffering, is not to just uh, grasp the, the 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 word itself or a translation of suffering. We all know what suffering is, <clears throat> but it's very. Uh, this is the uniqueness of the Buddhist teaching: was taking suffering as as his first sermon after enlightenment. What did he teach? He taught the five. Disciples in Tarnat, they thought there is suffering, there is the origin of suffering, there is the cessation, and there is the way of non-suffering, a full path. So this, this was the wisdom teaching of someone who was enlightened. So it wasn't, you notice, he wasn't pointing to himself and saying, I'm... I'm an enlightened Buddha. In fact, his actual first statement after enlightenment, after he uh, say, as as uh, recorded in the scripture, was that he thought to himself after enlightenment, "How can you teach Dhamma? How can you teach something that that isn't uh, about language or concepts or grasping or controlling? What is ultimate freedom? How can you?" When it, when it has no form, no quality, nothing that you can can get hold of, and language itself, the thinking process is about sankaras. It's a sankara itself. Thinking is sankara, is is conditioned phenomena. So can you ever realize nibbana or unconditioned reality? Through thinking, of course you can't. It it uh, it it takes you so far, and then you have to let go. Thinking also <clears throat> means when we grasp the thoughts, we we it is is a time bound condition. It's about the past, present, and future. So, the the present is recognized. I must work hard now in order to attain enlightenment in the future is the general hope or wish or attitude of many of us is to now is just the, the means to getting a, a desired result in the future this is the thinking process this is about thinking about the future and the past the, the, the past is a memory like yesterday ask yourself Right now, you're here in this sala, Dhamma Hall, and yesterday, you remember yesterday, but you're here. And so you begin to notice that memory is, is about the past. You remember things that you did or said yesterday or five years ago, ten years ago. It can go back twenty, thirty years ago, depending on how old you are. We have retentive memory to remember things of the past. So the past is only a, a memory of perception in the present. It has no uh, other reality. Unless we grasp memories and then we can, uh, and then we create moods. And for the happy memories we feel good, uh, we make us feel happy. If they're unpleasant, bad memories, they make us feel that way. So, just exploring, investigating what memory is, it's always here and now, experience is always now, 
It, you can't, you know, if you think that experience of enlightenment is in the future, that's a thought that you're having now. The future, what is that now? What is tomorrow when you're sitting here at this very moment? And that's the unknown, isn't it? It's maybe, it's speculation, it's expectation, hope, fear, dread, worry, anxiety are, are the mental states we create around the future. We hope everything's going to be okay. We fear everything's going to fall apart. Um, you know, the, the, so the future in the present right now is a perception, isn't it? It's, uh, it's possibility, potential. But it's knowing also, when we know that the future is the unknown potential possibility, we're looking at it in terms of what it really is in the present. We're not trying to, to uh, figure out what, whether we'll succeed or fail in the future or how life is going to be for us later on, but we're only interested in the present moment, putting the future in the context of Dhamma, as a perception, a perception is like, is, is this way we create possibility. It could be, I hope, I expect, I dread, I fear, I worry about the future. Now, Bhutto then is knowing this. When we take refuge in Buddha Dhamma Sangha, this is the, uh, and then we, 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 we chant, we chant the, the uh, refuges in Pali language, um, part of a ceremony, but with Vipassana, with, with wisdom, we're internalizing these refuges. It's not just a, a ceremony out there but it becomes much more profound than just chanting Pali words or assuming that Buddha Dhamma Sangha is some kind of mystical force in the universe, uh, seeing it always as uh, Buddha nature somewhere out there or in space or what, however you, you perceive uh, Bhutang Tamang Sankang Namasami. So internalizing, what do I mean by that? What is, what, when I say you internalize Bhutto Tamo Sanko, is that you investigate what is Bhutto in the present moment? What is Buddha here and now? And it's, it's our ability to be mindful, to be awake to Dhamma, to reality. So, it's not personal, like I, I, I can't claim that uh, as a personal achievement, but I can certainly be mindful uh, of the present moment. And that mindfulness itself, that awareness with wisdom is Bhutto or Buddha. So this is like internalizing, this seeing Buddha is not something distant or remote or uh, just a historical figure, but the reality of now, because this is where reality is, is here and now. And then Buddha knows Dhamma, knows the way things are, is awake to reality. And so it's not personal anymore, it's not taking refuge in Buddha, this the conventional personality, the sense of being this this body, this person, is is a thinking process. It's created, so it's it's not. We're no longer holding to the personality, the ego, as or the physical forms of our bodies as 
as uh, that we do if we don't awaken to Dharma, but we're seeing them in terms of what they are, the sankharas in the present moment. And this word sankhara is a generic term for all conditioned phenomena. It includes everything from the sun and moon, the stars, uh, the whole universal system to uh, just uh, whatever you're feeling, pleasure, pain, neutral sensations, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking, emotions, subtle, coarse, whatever, their quality. Because some cars are about qualities, about size, their objects. So, you know, when we look at, we look at sankharas, we see sankharas, the eyes themselves are sankharas. But consciousness, it, it, through, through the eyes, consciousness, it, the eyes come through consciousness. Consciousness isn't in the eyes. And so, we're taking refuge in puto, tamo, and then sankho, is those who practice in the direct and right way. Supatipano, Ujupatipano. Notice that these three refuges are not, they're, they're helpful in dealing with the ego uh, and, the, and the, the insidious kind of uh, assumptions we make about ourselves as, as a physical body, as a person, as a personality, as a type. We're not condemning it, but we're putting it in perspective to see it in terms of re reality is sankharas are impermanent. Sampe, sankara, anicca, all conditions are impermanent. Now this makes it very easy for us. Uh, you don't, re you may not realize how the great gift of the Buddha Dhamma, Buddha's teaching, is it simplifies everything. Because we, we, we live with all these sankharas, with ignorance, not understanding them. We're constantly kind of reacting, liking, disliking, fearing, dreading, hoping, feeling guilty, remorseful, resentful for things of the past. In, in anyone's life, isn't it? In anyone's life, there's a lot to resent. Life isn't the experience of fairness and justice and, and goodwill that it should be. We have those moments, but so much of one's life is the experience of, the, the, of fear and, and injustice, unfairness. So then we remember that in the present, and then we feel angry, indignant, we feel uh, we want to seek revenge sometimes, or, you know, what are, what are the wars about? But people lost in their delusions of themselves and their cultural religious biases. <clears throat> If they see Dhamma, if, if the refuge is in Dhamma, then that, that is universal, that's not personal anymore. So, Dhamma is what the Buddha was teaching. The Buddha never taught Buddhism. Buddhism came, <laughs> he taught Dhamma, the way things are. You know. Now this is important because there are so many uh, different traditions, Buddhist traditions we call Buddhism. Uh, it's now because it's such an ancient teaching and has uh, changed according to cultures and situations. But the core of the teaching, the basic Dhamma teaching is, is the same. The Four Noble Truths remains the, the, the heart, the the central point of of any Buddhist tradition. Now, suffering is uh, 
is is ordinary. It's not like special kinds of terrible suffering or mistreatment or traumas. It can be that. It includes that. But also it just means even in one's privileged life where one has been treated fairly well and had all kinds of social uh, opportunities to enjoy and have wealth and social position, there's still dukkha, there's still suffering. And that suffering is, is, uh, is then put into the context of noble truth. So what's noble and true about suffering? Before I encountered Buddha Dhamma, I thought suffering was a nasty fact of life, something you don't want. I wanted happiness. I wanted security, safety, stability, happiness and, and love and all the best that I could think of. But suffering... I didn't want. And then the Buddha, when he gives his first sermon to the five disciples in Saranath, says, there is suffering, there is dukkha. And then he tells you, he kind of points to the fact that to understand dukkha, dukkha should be understood rather than just rejected, uh, suppressed, annihilated, So this is a changing from someone, from, from just the dualistic function of personality, of like, our personal likes and dislikes, our longing for happiness and security, uh, and our dread of being rejected, of being vilified, of losing our position, losing our fortune, losing our health. to taking these, these kind of fears and desires and putting them in the context of a noble truth. And then it should be understood. To understand something, to understand anything, you have to accept it for what it is. If you're just reacting to life, if you're just caught in, in that kind of push-button, uh, knee-jerk reaction to praise and blame, success and failure, then you never understand yourself or life or anything very uh, at, at all. You know, just be caught in the momentum of of ha habitual reactivity. But like this weekend, this opportunity made available here at Wat Buddha Dhamma is to investigate, to get to the to the root of our human condition. And we can do that. That is not asking something beyond anyone's ability. Whether you do it or not, it's up to you. But, but the opp opportunity is uh, is here and now. The the situation is very good. The natural s nature helps. The uh, trees, the forests, the the sky the ground, everything uh, is is not here to entice us or to delude us. It is natural phenomena without that much being interfered with and too much uh, changed by human desires. So this first noble truth should be understood, and then that that means that we begin to we change our attitude towards our own anxiety, whether it's just feeling of just disease or regrets about past actions or resentment, whatever form uh, of suffering that you're experiencing, you're looking at it with wisdom. And, and when I say this, this is seeing that in terms of the three characteristics, anicca, dukkha, anatta, which is uh, impermanence. One thing that, that all conditioned phenomena, all sankharas, 
share as a characteristic is impermanence. They arise and cease. They're not ultimate reality. They arise and cease according to other conditions. So then, you know, whatever you're feeling now, whatever uh, emotional state you, you're experiencing at this moment, it is what it is, you know. You, you can't just create pleasant emotional states and sustain them. In, in especially in meditation, or many negative states arise. <coughs> Uh, self-doubt and and restlessness and uh, things arise in in consciousness, but now we're we're seeing them in terms of uh, with wisdom. They are conditioned phenomena. They arise. If they arise, they cease. And then to understand dukkha means to accept the 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 condition for what it is, meaning you just leave it let it be what it is, and you'll begin to see its changingness rather than just be caught in your own personal emotional reaction to it. So this is like patient endurance. In, uh, when, I first, when I was learning Thai, the first year with Lung Hoa Cha, uh, you know, it's quite... Um, in those days, Wat Bapong was a very basic place. It didn't, it didn't have any electricity, and life was, uh, the, even, even the food, Lung Po Cha liked to mix all the food up in one <coughs> big uh, basin. And uh, so we had to, and they ladle it out in our alms bowls. So the food was terrible. The, the, uh, Conditions were very basic, no kind of comfort. Slept on grass mats, and uh, I used, and then I'd hear uh, Lung Po Cha be saying in Thai Toraman, and uh, the word, Thai word Toraman really means patient endurance to bear with uh, physical discomfort or emotional pain or uh, or whatever you're experiencing to to allow it to be it's not kind of grin and bear it attitude but an attitude of patient mindfulness in a, in a way of of looking understanding suffering rather than just reacting to it with trying trying to get rid of it but my American mind would translate Toraman as torture. I had this sense of being tortured. And we say Lung Po Cha likes to torture us, but that wasn't that was not the the real force behind Lung Po Cha's uh, t attitudes at that time, and this patient endurance, being willing to to bear with, to accept what you don't like. Uh, and let it be what it is, and to and to keep reminding yourself that it is what it is, because that's an honest and direct approach. Whatever you're feeling at this moment, it may not be what you want or want to feel, or if it feels pleasant, you want to stay uh, have it stay that way all the time. But if you just let it be what it is, it you'll begin to notice that whatever it is, it's changing. It, it doesn't sustain itself. And that changing always is the, you know, arising, le leading to cessation, birth leading to death, beginning leading to an end. So meditation, then the word English word is a is a word used for any kind of mental training. You know, it can be it covers so many generic term for any kind of mental act, training activity. But in uh, the Buddhist context, you have um, samatha vipassana. Uh, 
uh, these words, the samatha is, is concentration on an object, where you choose one object and concentrate on it. Uh, and that's uh, like the breath, you, you, you can use anapanasati as, as samatha meditation. You can use puto as samatha meditation because it leads towards tranquility, towards a more tranquil um, arom or mental, mental result. But that's not, that's still not the, the enlightenment, not the liberation from suffering, because it's, it's, it's still focusing on one thing, and it's not reflecting on the way things are. So, with vipassana, it's, it's, it means insight into um, the Four Noble Truths or the way things are. All conditions are impermanent. All Dhamma, in, Dhamma, our refuge is in Dhamma, not in any, there's no ultimate personality uh, that we take refuge in. We're taking refuge in awareness, in reality itself, rather than in the idea of reality. And the reality then is, is learning to trust yourself to be the observer, the puto, knowing dhammo, rather than this person trying to get rid of defilements, trying to get samadhi, trying to find uh, happiness and bliss, wanting to to um, having good meditations and bad meditations. Some people, Lung Po Chao used to say, good meditation is good, bad meditation is good. So, it's, <laughs> so even bad meditation, we learn from from bad meditation. With good meditation, when we get what we want, we feel blissful and happy, then we, then we, if we're not wise, if we're not aware of Dhamma, then we want to have that all the time. You know, so we, we try to, to get bliss every time we do formal meditation practices, and then if we don't get them, then it's bad meditation. But with wisdom, Bad meditation is seen as, as just uh, another sankhara. It's like this, and 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 you begin to develop, you know, cultivate patient endurance, and and you you're no longer seeking uh, samadhi or blissful states through memories of having had them before or through creating ideals of what they are uh, that you hope to attain. It's learning to awaken, trust, observe, notice that all conditioned phenomena is impermanent. So I'll stop here and uh, leave you to your own practice. <laughs>